As I said, we begin 40 days of fasting and prayer here in a couple of weeks. And I hope everybody will sign up. Our goal is that we would be fasting and praying 24 hours of the day. Every meal throughout the week, there would be multiple people fasting at that time. That's how we all fast 40 days of prayer and fasting. We all pull together. Fasting is a, um, a spiritual discipline. There are other spiritual dif- disciplines. Prayer is one. Praise is one. Believe it or not, solitude can be a spiritual discipline, just getting alone with God. There are all kinds of spiritual dif- disciplines, but fasting is a discipline that has been largely forgotten by most Christians today. Uh, we don't know very much about it. The Bible calls us to fast. As followers of Jesus, not just people in the old part of the Bible, but as followers of Jesus, the Bible calls us to fast. It does that often. Fasting is God's idea. It's not human's idea. In fact, the book of Isaiah, and we'll talk about it in a moment, talks about God's chosen fast. God chooses that we would fast. But the question for us is, but how? How do we do it? Now, I'm going to say a weird thing that if I said it in some settings, people would get really offended. I don't think you will because you've heard me say other weird things. But I'm going to say something kind of odd. <clears throat> when it comes to the how, how do we fast, the Bible is not much help. The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of help in this. Now, there's lots of fasting in the Bible, a lot. And God calling people to fast. During times of of national emergencies, people fast. When they see that they made a great error and they repent, they very often would fast. In the minor prophets especially, there are multiple calls for what are known as solemn assemblies that involve designated times of fasting for three days or two days or a day or maybe longer in the way we're doing it. There are times that the Bible calls people to fast so that they can avoid disaster that may be on the way. There are times the Bible says people should fast when they want to hear from God. They need to get clear instruction. Fast. Even the people that were the critics of Jesus, they knew all about fasting. Those critics of his told him, we fast twice a week, twice a week. They knew all about fasting. People fasted a lot, but here's the problem. Because it was so common, because everybody did it, and everybody knew what was involved, because people fasted for national reasons, and they fasted for personal reasons, and they understood, like Jesus would explain, that there are certain things that only happen when you add fasting to your prayer. Because everybody was clued in and geared into that. When the call came to fast, everybody knew exactly what they had to do, how to prepare for the fast, how to go about it, how to come off of a fast. Everybody knew when the leaders called it was time to fast. They knew what it meant. They didn't need a how-to because they knew how-to. And so that's why there are no how-tos in the Bible. And that's why I say it's not much help. In the Bible, there's just an expectation that we as the followers of God, we would fast. That we would fast. Now, it's not a popular idea. There's not a lot of Christian speakers on television that talk very much about it. In fact, Christians effectively act like they don't believe it. (laughs) That it's worthwhile at all. And I, I say that because we don't fast. So let's do just for a minute, a few minutes, a little mini-seminar on how to. First, let's talk about some ways to fast. And there are different ways that you can fast. There's a partial fast. 
It's a, it's a kind of a fast that involves one meal on select days. That's what we're asking you to do over these 40 days that are coming up. Select Tuesday noon. And during that time that you would prepare your dinner or you would eat it, you, you, you pray instead. If you're at work, maybe you go out in the car and that becomes your closet of prayer. But you fast one meal a day on select days. Or maybe every day you fast the same meal. That's a partial fast. There's another kind of partial fast where you eliminate certain foods for the entire time or all week or select days. Now, it's got to be a food that you really like. Otherwise, it's not very effective. I, it doesn't count, I don't think, if you decide I'm going to fast kale chips. It, it doesn't count if you pick a food that's nasty. <laughs> it's, you don't get credit for that. But a partial fast where you eliminate certain foods and typically it's a food that you kind of like. Or maybe a food that you eat often. Maybe bread or something like that. There's another kind of partial fast where you just eat smaller portions than usual. And that can be beneficial in a lot of ways. There's a fast where you, you eat but you drink only water. You, you don't drink coffee or tea or sodas or anything else, juices, it's just water, that would be a kind of fast too. And then, the, and then there's the, what's called the Daniel fast, where it's just vegetables, fruit, grains, and water only. Daniel fast. There's a 24-hour fast. And, and you're thinking, wow, I don't know if I could go 24 hours. That seems kind of extreme to me. Let me explain to you how you do it. It's not really that hard. You eat dinner, 6 o'clock whatever your dinner time is. You eat your dinner. The next day, no breakfast, no lunch. You sit down at 6 o'clock to your dinner. You just fasted 24 hours. It's fairly painless that way. You can fast things beside food. Tino has posted a, a slide on, on Facebook that talks about different kinds of fasts. And you can fast from television. Just during this time, I'm not going to... I'm not going to watch it. You can fast from your computer, and, except for what you've got to do for your work. But I just stay away from it, because you know how we can be with that thing. You, you fast from billboards, maybe. I do that. I go through periods where I absolutely refuse to look at those things, because the genius behind advertising is to make you unhappy with the way you're living right now, and the only way you'll be happy is if you get that toothpaste. So I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to sell you my eyeballs. So you fast from advertising, billboards. You can fast from social media, obviously. You can fast from your phone except for making legitimate calls. Don't use it for everything else. You can fast in the way you read your Bible, too. Or, or you can fast and the only thing you do read is the Bible. I'm not going to read news for this time. I'm not going to keep up that way. I've done this before, and after a month or so, I come back, and I look at the news, and those people are fighting over the same things they were when I left off. So you're not really going to miss all that much. But limit your reading to your Bible only, or maybe limit your Bible reading to the Psalms only. What I'm saying is there are different ways that you can fast. There are different ways that you can go about it. And then you can also add prayer to your fasting. Again, Jesus said there are certain things that only happen when you do that, when you add prayer to your fasting. Well, what are some things that you can pray for? Well, I'm going to be asking you to pray for a lot of things on that golden sheet back there that you can take with you when we get down to the 40 days of prayer and fasting. Here's some things that you can fast during the time that you would be eating or you would be preparing. You can fast for the work and the leaders and, and the finances and the future of our church. We, we need God's help, and we need God's guidance. We just went through a month of listening to four different church leaders talk about what they sense God is seeing and saying about us for the future, for our church in the year to come. And how are we going to implement all of that? So you can pray that way. You can pray for the influence that this church has all around the world through the different Zoom sessions that we do and through missions giving and through online things. There are by the end of the week, there will be hundreds and hundreds of people that watch what is being recorded now and will be 
streamed later today. And our AMA on Thursday night, we get people all around the world and all across the nation that are watching that thing. Your church is known all around the world. Just a very quick story. It's been a while back now, but I got a call, a contact, a message from a church leader in Sri Lanka. That's a great big island off the coast of India. And he told me that their church had gone through a time of discouragement. They were great, in great despair for some national reasons and things that were going haywire in their area, but other reasons as well. It was a young church. It was a new church, fairly new church, and mostly young people, about 200 people. But they went through a time of discouragement when he stumbled on our Sunday morning that Matt puts up in, in the afternoon later today, 2 o'clock and 2.15. He'll put up the worship package. He'll, he'll put up the message. And they somehow stumbled across that, and they began to listen to our worship. And they would play it over and over again until they got the songs down. And then they began to do our worship package in their service. And, and then they would listen. He listened to the messages. And whoever was bringing the message that day, he would take notes and he would look at the slides. One of the reasons we put things on the screen is so people in other places can capture what we're doing. And he would capture all of that. And then he would preach our message the next week. And that depression in his church began to lift. And they began to experience revival. And so a while back they asked me via Zoom, they put it on a big screen, and I spoke to their church. God's doing great things. Pray for the influence of your church. I told it, a, a friend this past week. I ran into Pastor David Go from the garden. And I, he said, what are you doing lately that's new? And I told him about some of the things we're doing via Zoom, how we're reaching people. Last week I was with a group in Congo. And I was training them. And people all over India and Nepal and Pakistan and and Singapore, and Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Japan, and, and Fiji, and, and the things that God is doing through what we're able to do. And I said, David, it's absolutely stupid to me. The numbers of people that we're reaching, and it's so easy to do. But your church footprint is big around the world. It's big around the world. The way I like to say it is we punch well above our weight. So pray for the influence that we have through missions and Zoom and online and other things. Pray, pray as, you, as you fast. You can pray for the protection of the children and the youth and the young adults and the seniors and the singles and the marriages in our church. Do that. Because you know as well as I do that the enemy has put a bead on all those. He's put a target on all those, especially marriages. You can pray for the Holy Spirit to move every time we get together. You can pray for the lost in your family. You can pray for the lost people that you know in your workplace or your lost neighbors and do it by name. And you can do it during that time that you're fasting. You see, you can add prayer to your fasting. And Jesus said again that there are certain things that only happen when we do that. You can pray for the poor who are Jesus' special friends. You can pray for the outreaches that we do to those special friends. You can pray for our broken world. You know our world is badly broken. Pray for the Ukraine. Pray for what's happening in the Middle East. Don't just wring your hands about what's going on in Washington with all those knotheads. Pray. Do you realize by your prayers, with your fasting, you can go places you would never be invited? You can go into the White House. You can affect what happens in the West Wing. You can affect by your prayers what takes place in the Supreme Court and in the halls of Congress. You'll never be invited into those committee rooms, but you can affect it by your prayers. And when you add fasting to your prayers, you're ramping up the power of what's going on because it's a spiritual discipline. It moves life in the spirit world. So pray for your broken world. Pray for God's help in your own life. How do you need God's help? Do you need a healing in your family? Do you need a financial miracle? What do you need? Are there relationships that are frayed and broken? You can pray for your own needs while you fast. So you add prayer to your fasting. But let's talk for a moment about Scripture and fasting. Because while you're fasting, you can think about God's Word. You can meditate on God's Word. You can let it saturate you. You can marinate in God's Word. 
and there's something that happens when we're praying and we're fasting, and then we begin to turn to God's Word, not for data and information or to figure out schemes or timelines, but we begin to turn to God's Word to hear the voice of God. And you can meditate on Scripture. On that sheet, I've given you some Scriptures you can meditate on, places like Psalm 16. Psalms like that force you to look inside, to evaluate yourself. And, and then you can invite the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit. You can pray the 139th Psalm, Search me, O God, when you've searched yourself and you've laid yourself before God and you've asked Him to cleanse you and fill you and fix you. But our hearts are deceitfully wicked, and even in prayer we can hide things from God that we don't want to talk about or face. And so you pray that bold prayer. I dare you to pray the 139th Psalm. Search me, O God, and see if there's some wicked way in me. Know my thoughts. And God will put his thumb on the thing that needs fixing. You can meditate on God's word during prayer. Scriptures like Micah 6.8 People talk all the time about, I don't know what God wants for me. I don't know God's will for my life. It's spelled out in Micah 6, 8. He's shown you, O oh man, and he's not just talking to the males of the species. He's talking to all human beings. He's shown you, people, what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly. Do what's fair. Do what's right. Do justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. You meditate on that. That will change your life. You can turn to a scripture like Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. We have a lot of reasons to be anxious, a lot of anxiety today. There's a lot of therapists making a lot of money off of anxiety. That's why I'm not sure they want to cure it necessarily. There's a lot of anxiety, but the Bible says be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, that's the asking kind of prayer, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, put lots of thanksgiving in your prayer, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, while he's answering your prayer, if you season it, salt it with lots of gratitude, while he's answering your prayer as a byproduct to every answered prayer, he gives a peace that you can't analyze and you can't comprehend. And you don't know where it came from, but it's real. The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You think on that. You think on that. You meditate on that while you fast and pray. You turn your attention to words like that. And among other things, your blood pressure will decrease and your outlook will improve as you marinate your soul in what God has to say about things. So along with your fasting, add prayer. And along with your fasting, add scripture. But let's just take a few minutes and then I'm done. In this little mini seminar, to talk about reasons to fast. Why should you fast? I'm just going to give you four. There are many, but why should you fast? Number one, fast when I'm in trouble. When I'm troubled inside, when I'm troubled, when I'm distressed by problems in the world. We, we absorb a lot of information and a lot of it is distressing. And a lot of it is distressing because we feel powerless to do anything about it. But we are not powerful, powerless. The Bible says that our weapons, the weapons of our warfare, are powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. That's fortresses, towers, battlements, castles. We can pull down the enemy's strongholds with our fasting and prayer. So when do I fast and when do I pray? When I'm troubled by problems in the world, please understand that fasting before God is not a hunger strike. It's not throwing some kind of a temper tantrum where I'm not going to eat until I get my way. You almost hear people talk about it that way sometimes, but it's not a hunger strike. Again, that passage in Isaiah that talks about the chosen fast, well, what does the Lord say there? Well, he says a lot. He says a lot. He, he tells us that 
He's chosen a fast for us. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loosen the chains of wickedness? To undo the bonds of the yoke? What's a yoke? It's a heavy burden on your back, on your neck that you can't wiggle out of. That forces you to serve somebody else. That doesn't allow you freedom of movement. That turns you into a beast of a burden. That causes you to do somebody else's bidding that you don't want to do. And he says, is not the fast that I have chosen this to loosen the chains of wickedness, to undo the bonds of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? Some of your Bibles talk about justice and to break every yoke. He breaks the enemy's chains over us when we fast. When we're troubled, when we're all knotted up, when we're distressed and upset and discouraged, fasting is in order. Because this word says that it will break the bonds. It will undo the chains of wickedness. And it will cause the oppressed to go free. And you may be the oppressed that needs to go free. You know, there are a lot of analysts today. You can look at all the problems in the world. You can read all the public policy statements. You can listen to the analysts and the, 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 the people that tell us all their best wisdom. There are an awful lot of analysts today that can tell us what's wrong. So I take it that analyzing the problems is fairly easy because there are a lot of people that will step up and do that. There are a lot of people that can tell you what's wrong. But there are few, very few that will fast. Why? Because it's not easy. But there's a tremendous untapped power when we add fasting to our prayers. And it will break the chains of the enemy and oppression over people and nations and events. There are a lot of people that will analyze, but there are few that will fast. Nehemiah, he faced this. He, he faced, he was troubled by problems in his world. Everything is going fine for Nehemiah. As a young boy, he was taken from his home in Jerusalem, but that was a, a long time ago, and he's been made to serve these foreign masters, but he's done well. And he's moved up through the ranks, and he's one of the king's chief advisors. And the king of Persia would often call upon Nehemiah for his wisdom and his advice and his help. He was a good problem solver, Nehemiah. Things had gone well for him. As I say, he was, he was successful by anybody's standards. He didn't really have any personal needs. But one day some people came to him that had survived in Jerusalem, the city he'd been taken care of, taken out of. And he asked these fellows, what's it like back there, home? And they gave him a sour report. It was not good. They said, well, the people that are there, our people that are still left there, they're distressed. And, and they're, they're made fun of by everybody around them. They're harassed and they're persecuted. And the walls of our city are all broken down. And the gates have been burned with fire. And it's a wasteland. And the temple is completely demolished and looted. And what did Nehemiah find necessary do, to do? He says, when I heard these words, I sat down. And I wept and I mourned for days. But he did something else. I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. When should I fast? What are some reasons to fast when you're troubled? By problems in your world or problems somewhere in the world? There's another reason to fast when you want more of God. When you want more of God than you want anything. When, when you want more of God than you want more of anything. Fast. You know, one of the things that fasting does is it reveals to us on a very deep level, what are the things that control me? What's really in charge in my life? We, we live in a day when we're told, you deserve to be well fed. Three square meals every day, big ones. Extra portions if you wanted and snacks in between. And if you get up in the middle of the night and you're like me, you need what 
Winnie the Pooh called a little something. We live in a day where we're told you, you should be well fed. Every day, all day. Don't deny yourself. Don't deny yourself food, but don't deny yourself every, anything. Every, every desire is legitimate. If you desire it, it's right. And, and you owe it to yourself to satisfy it. We live in that kind of a time. We're denying ourselves is out of step with our world. It's out of step with our times. But please note, I'm sure you have, that our times are crazy times. Our times don't make any sense. We live in what Paul would have called perilous times, difficult times. Our world is a crazy world. So we're out of step with it when we talk about fasting. Our world is not healthy. Our world is falling apart. So the opinion that the world might have and says, oh, it's wrong not to satisfy yourself. It's wrong to think about fasting. I wouldn't listen to that world. You really can't do better than what Paul talks about in his letter to the Philippian church. He says, whatever things were gained to me, he's, he's just gone through a, a list of reasons that he should have an edge in a relationship with God. He's done so many things right, he says. He's accomplished so much in his life that should commend him to God. But he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He's taken all of his accomplishments and heaped them up in a pile. And he said, they're really not worth anything not compared with knowing Jesus. And that's what he means when he says, whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. And in that third chapter of Philippians, he goes on and he says most amazingly, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but rubbish, they're garbage that I might gain Christ and may be found in him, be found in Christ. That's what he wants more than anything, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, the rightness that comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him. Listen, here's the money verse, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, just like him. What's he telling us there? He's telling us a lot. And I don't think you can do better than what he's telling us there. He's telling us that nothing, nothing is as important as knowing Jesus. You hear his cry, oh, that I may know him. I'll give everything, and he has given everything, that I may know him. Even if I have to know him in difficulty, he says, I, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, and who wouldn't? But if it comes down to it, I'll know him in the fellowship of his suffering. I'll suffer like he did. How did he suffer? He suffered unfairly. I'll even know him that way if that's how I've got to know him, in the fellowship of his sufferings. I'll endure whatever I've got to endure, even hard things to find him, to know him. When should you fast? When you want more of God more than you want anything. Fast and he'll draw close to you. Thirdly, as we wrap this up, another reason to fast when you need a breakthrough. I, I like what the post that Tino put up says at the end of it. It says, whatever you need, fasting will get you there. It will get you there. There's a story in 2 Samuel about David, the great king. I talked about this on Friday at the funeral service for Hugh Riley. I referenced this story. I won't tell the whole thing. But David is in the process of losing a son that he loves, a little boy, a toddler, really. And David is so scared he's going to lose that child that he begins to pray like he never has before. And he begins to do something else. Because the child is so sick, he begins to fast. 
All night long, he fasts into the next day and the next and the next and the next and the next. He wouldn't eat food. When his advisors came to him with dinner, he wouldn't take it. He's fasting. He's praying. He's waiting for his boy to get better, but his boy dies. He didn't get his request granted. He didn't get the breakthrough the way he wanted it. But David was forever changed. When he got up from the floor with the dirt, the soil from the tabernacle under his fingernails because he had gripped the ground, begging God to heal his boy, fasting for seven days straight. When he went back to normal life, he was never the same again. He was changed forever. Even though it wasn't granted, he was changed forever. See, up to that point, David had lived by what you could almost call a gangster mentality. He was a bloody man. Revenge was his first nature, not his second nature. He did strange things to get ahead. But after that, he wasn't wild anymore. After that time of extended fasting and prayer, his behavior wasn't ever again erratic. But he was calm and he was confident. Because now he knows God on a deep, deep level. Because God has broken through for him. His boy was not spared. He says at the end of the ordeal, I'm going to live in such a way that I will see that boy again. He didn't get what he was praying for, but he was forever changed. And he had a breakthrough that he wasn't even expecting. And this bloody, this bloody offender, this man was a rapist. He's transformed. He's changed. And he becomes known as the man after God's own heart. That's how great the change. And he sits down and he writes the Psalms that you read for comfort. Fasting breaks strongholds around you. Fasting breaks strongholds in you. It flattens obstacles in your path. And when you fast, it accelerates the moving of God in your life. And it intensifies the power of God. One final thing, very quickly. Fast when you sense God preparing you for something new. Fasting should be intensely private. One of Jesus' cautions was, don't be like those that fast and let everybody know because they let their clothes get kind of shabby and they have a long face. says, I'm hungry. (laughs) Feed me, Seymour. (laughs) He says, don't be like that. Don't be like people that say, oh, yeah, I'm fasting, you know. You get invited to lunch. No, I'm sorry, brother. I'm not. I'm fasting. (laughs) He says, you do that kind of nonsense, you're going to get your reward. You'll get noticed, but that's all. He says, don't be like that. It's intensely private fasting. Joel talks about fasting. Joel, the prophet, talks about fasting. He knew what it was all about. He says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning. And tear your heart and not your garments. And return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate. And you learn that when you fast. You learn that. It's never too late. It's never too late for God to do something new in you. You fast when you sense God wanting you to do something new, preparing you for something new. And who doesn't feel that? That describes you, doesn't it? You have a sense that God is not finished with you. That's why you're still on the planet. And I concur with your opinion. That is why you're still on the planet, because he wants to do something new with you. That resonates in you. Because God does desire and he's preparing you to do something new. So now it's not too late. 
It's not too late. Begin to fast. Begin to pray. I think of that old lady, Anna. We named our oldest daughter after her. Faithful Anna. The Bible says that she spent her days, years, night and day in the temple. She never left. And that she spent her time there in the temple night and day with fasting and prayers. And what happened because of her extended fasting and prayer is she saw, she held in her own arms the baby Messiah. She got what she longed for before she left the earth. She was in her late 80s, in her 90s maybe. But God had something new for her. And she knew that, she sensed that, so she fasted and she prayed. He's preparing us for something new. So we need to fast. The Bible says, Psalm 35, I humbled my soul with fasting. I humbled my soul. I don't know about you, but the way I gallop through life, I need some humbling every once in a while. I need that. We need that. God says he will humble our soul with fasting so that we can hear him and he can do something new and there can be a breakthrough and we get more of God than we've ever had before. And the troubles and the problems that distress us, God will intervene and he will reverse the course of things in our own life, in our own selves, and in nations as well. It's an untapped resource, folks. It's been too long neglected. So I encourage you as we begin to move into this season of fasting and prayer that you would be part of it. And maybe you put a sticker on there and you're going to fast a meal. Maybe you'll reconsider and say, maybe I'll add two or three more to that. The more we fast, the more it intensifies God's participation. The more it magnifies His power. The more it intensifies what He's able to do in our lives. It's one of those cases where the more we sow, the more we reap. Why don't we stand together? Now the things we've talked about... <laughs>